This past week, Gary and I had to have a talk. Now, we are not yellers. We never yell when we get mad. It's just we never have done that. I don't think there's anything wrong with yelling. But we're talkers, and it gets pretty heated. And so we had to have a talk because I had hurt his feelings. Um, often when I'm expressing myself, I get emotional, and I can come off as harsh. And so I had done that, which is not terribly unusual for us. And we were kind of talking it through. We were having a heated discussion. And I suddenly realized that I was really angry with him. I didn't know why I was angry, but I felt real anger and frustration at him. And, I, and he said, well, what are you angry about? And I said, I don't have a clue, but I know I'm really mad at you. And I, I couldn't tell him why. And so I really had to take a couple days and think about what was it that was making me so angry. So today we're continuing our discussion of boundaries. And uh, we're talking about boundaries with our spouse and I want to give you three ways for you to decide if maybe you have boundary issues. If maybe there are some three, some of these, some things that would be a hint to you. Because we may not know because we've been married for a really long time or maybe we ignore our feelings. So here are some things that you need to pay attention to. There's three things. The first one is you need to listen to your feelings. So I took note this time when I felt the frustration because I thought, what am I angry about? What has happened that set me off? And so I, I spent a couple days trying to think about that. And we should listen to our feelings. Our feelings are sometimes uh, more telling than we realize. In fact, even if you don't let your feelings out, think about what you're feeling when they're talking to you. What are you saying inside? Are you being snarky inside? Are you, what, it, what is it you feel? A second thing is, is listen to your desires. Because when we get married, we have this tendency to have different desires. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to be able to express what we feel. So an example would be some people uh, desire to be together all the time and some people desire to be alone. There's nothing wrong with either of those. But you have to talk it through. You have to see if you're conflicting desires, if there's a compromise somewhere. And then the third thing is you have um, to know your limits. A lot of times in relationships, you'll have one person who maybe is more of a asker and one who's more of a giver. And if you were forever asking things of your spouse, um, that's okay. But the person who's being asked all the time might feel a little used. But here, here's the deal. It's not the fault of the asker. It's the fault of the one who always says yes because you're not giving that other person any boundaries. And so if you're feeling like you're getting stretched or you're feeling like you're doing more or you're feeling like it's not fair, then pay attention to your limits. What are your limits? What are they telling you? So all three of these are things that will kind of give you an idea that there might be something you have to work on. But I think now we should go to our scripture lesson today, which comes out of the book of Ephesians. It's a scripture lesson that I can't stand. And you'll know why in a few minutes. And we'll talk about it. We'll unpack it. But I, I'm going to be really honest with you because I know some of you will be, as my daughter said, I was ready to leave. And so you'll be at the last service. So hear it through and then we're going to talk about this. So it's Ephesians 5 verses 22 through 33. For example, wives should submit to their husbands as if to the Lord. A husband is the head of his wife like Christ is the head of the church. That is the savior of the body. So wives submit to their husbands in everything like the church submits to Christ. As for husbands, love your wives just like Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. He did this to make her holy by washing her in a bath of water with the word. He did this to present himself with a splendid church, one without any sort of stain or wrinkle on her clothing and her clothes, but rather one that is holy and blameless. That's how husbands ought to love their wives in the same way as they do their own bodies. Anyone who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hates his own body, but feeds it and takes care of it just like Christ does for the church. Because we are all parts of the body, this is why a man will leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two of them will become one body. Marriage is like a, is a significant allegory. And I'm applying it to Christ and the church. In any case, for you individually, each one of you should love his wife as himself, and wives who respect their husbands. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to talk about three different things that's going to kind of unpack this a little bit for you. We're going to talk about different culture. 
a radical message and the differences between men and women and how we're different. So let's first talk about the first century, a different culture. This is a really important thing to understand. In the first century, it was all about the household code. Really, I mean, everybody talked about being a good manager of your house, and the household, hold, the household code was very important because they felt like the household was a microcosm of the whole society. And if you had an unhealthy or unmanaged home, the society was unmanaged. And so everybody took this very seriously. And there was um, three, this is with the roles of men in the very first century. Men have had three superior roles. They were master, husband, and father to his slaves, his wife, and his children. And everyone was to serve him and the interests of the family. And this was the common setup in the first century, and everybody understood that. And how he managed his house mattered. And then one day you come to church, because remember this is during the time of the birth of the church, and Christian men, converted men, are being challenged with this passage that says, you are to love your wife like Christ loves the church. Now, this is just doesn't even make sense because in the first century, marriages were designed and created. They were more of a contract than they were for love. People didn't marry for love and romance like we do now. It was a contract. And so suddenly, this marriage, the way the culture looked at marriage is being shifted. And they're being told, oh, you're supposed to love your wife. And you'd be like, wait, what? Love her? I may not like her. Why would I love her? Our society, that's not what this relationship is about. But suddenly, they're being challenged to something that's really hard and really different. The same is true for the women. The women are being challenged to not serve their husbands, but instead respect them. Think about it. I have to serve him and respect him? Are you kidding me? I mean, it wasn't the way it went. I mean, she'd probably talking to her girlfriends and dogging at them all the time, and suddenly I'm being challenged about how the way I live my life with this man I serve, I'm supposed to respect him, submit to him. You can imagine those early Christians were really challenged by this and thinking, I don't think I can do this. I'm not sure I can change. I mean, we're being challenged to look at our marriages differently Jesus is comparing our marriage to the love that Christ has for his people, for the church, and that's setting the standard of my marriage? That's not what everybody else is doing. That's not the way you do life. And it was really probably felt like it wasn't possible. It was radical. And that's the thing. The gospel is always meant to be radical, it's meant to challenge you. It's meant to th for you to think, this is too hard to do on my own. I'm not sure I can do it. And you're supposed to have to lean into God to even have a prayer of accomplishing it. Think about it. The gospel is always challenging you to forgive someone that you don't want to forgive or, or love someone who's unlovable, to do the very thing that you don't want to do. That is the gospel. It turns everything upside down. And it's hard. And if you don't think the gospel of Jesus Christ is hard, then you're doing it wrong. Because it's hard. It's really hard to do the right thing. And now he was applying the gospel to their marriages. This was a major shift. This was a hard thing that was being asked of them. So you got to pause and say, well, how does this apply to us now? Now we marry for love. We've changed it all. We marry for romance. Sure, love and romance fade, but you get the idea. You go into this with your eyes wide open, knowing who this person is and loving them. And so it's a different scenario. So how do you apply this passage to today? Well, first of all, I think the challenge is still correct. It is to love your spouse like Christ loves the church. And that's not easy. And that's why we're talking about boundaries today, because that's a really hard ask to love a spouse. But I think in this day and age, it goes both ways. Women are not getting away with it by just respecting him. We both should love each other mutually, like Christ loves the church. The, bias, the bar is still high, but applies to both of us now. 
We should both radically love. Think about how Christ loved his church. He gave his life for his church. He laid down his life for us. I don't know. That's, that's a tall order. And we're called to respect and mutually submit to each other. Man, I don't know if I can do that. And that is literally why we're talking about boundaries today, because it takes healthy boundaries to love like Christ loves the church. I mean, you may feel like you have the boundary thing all taken care of, but I promise you there are probably places in your life where you compromised, where you decided not to push the envelope. You decided to just be satisfied. They've always been that way. They're going to always be that way. You've just kind of put up with something. But that's not what Christ is challenging the church to. We're being challenged to love the church like Christ loves the church. The goal isn't my little life. The goal is up here, this high standard of love that is, turns us upside down and is really radical. And you're not going to be able to do it without God's help. But a way to do it is with good and healthy boundaries. So I'm going to just kind of go over some boundaries. It's probably stuff we all know, but it's a good reminder. Because as we live a long time together, we sometimes let some of these things slip. And so we're going to begin with the very first thing of how to have a radically loving relationship that is a mutual submission. And the first thing is skin. You know your skin is a boundary? Your body has boundaries. And this is a little confused with scripture sometimes because in 1 Corinthians 7, 4, it says, a wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but her husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. This is about this mutual coming together where we submit to each other and we give to each other. And it isn't always um, all romance, is it? It is something that God calls us to do, but I want to say that even in the spite that that's in Scripture, we still have healthy boundaries with each other. We have bodily boundaries. No one should ever cross your boundaries physically. You have to be clear on that. If there's abuse, that is a huge boundary breaker, but if someone is just doing something to you, maybe teasing you or, or being rough with you, that's a boundary. You own your body. You may have decided to submit to another person, but that doesn't mean you're without boundaries, even with your personal skin, your body. The same thing can be applied. So then how, how should we treat our bodies? Well, that's really easy. Jesus says in 631, treat people in the same way you want them to treat you. It's also echoed in our passage today. That's how husbands ought to love their wives, the same way as they do their own bodies. Treat each other like you want to be treated, how you treat yourself. Your treatment of yourself should be no different than your treatment of your spouse. The next one is words. And words are really powerful, and words are so unused. We tend to just keep our mouths shut. We don't say anything because we don't want to pick a fight. We don't want to ruin the mood. We don't want to, everything's good right now. We don't want to make an issue. But the reality is, is we're supposed to use our words to express our boundaries. We're supposed to say things like, I'm not comfortable with that, or no or I don't want to. How many times do you go to a restaurant that you don't want to go to because you just don't want to say, I can't stand that place? I mean, think about it. We often, for a million different reasons, don't practice boundaries. But we're supposed to use our, our, our words. It's a gift to us. God's given us the voice, the, the words to say to be good to ourselves. And why are you using your words? Because you want to love that person like Christ loves the church. Think about it. By not using your words, you're not really loving them the way that Christ wants you to love them. You're not loving them radically. You're just keeping the peace. But you should use your words in love. You should never say anything. And do it in love and kindness. Think about how Jesus used to tell people things. They were willing to receive because there was love. It was done correctly. We also have to speak truth. I'm going to read... Ephesians 4.25, because it says, Therefore, have, after you have gotten rid of lying, each of you must tell the truth to your neighbor, because we are part of each other in the same body. How many of you don't consider it lying when you lie to your spouse, yet you do it all the time? Because you don't want to shake things up. Because you know how they might react. Because you know, like, oh, we're going out to dinner now. I'm not going to say anything. But the reality is, is that lying is lying, and you're not supposed to lie to your spouse. 
And they probably would be surprised to find out how often you lie because you just want to keep the peace. But the reality is, this applies everywhere. If you're not married, this applies to your friendships, your parents, your children. There's somebody that you're not speaking your truth to. And that's hurting the relationship. You think you're doing a good thing, and you're not. You are really limiting the type of love that you could have with that person. You are making it less than what it could be. Physical space. This is about consequences. And sometimes you have to give people consequences for their bad behavior. Physical space is, is, is hard to say, but sometimes people need to be held to what they have done. I want to read a passage to you, and I'll explain it. And it comes out of the book of Matthew. It's Matthew 18, 17. And it says, but if they still won't pay attention, report it to the church. If they don't pay attention even to the church, treat them as you would a Gentile or tax collector. What that's referring to is an ancient first century practice of giving consequences through shunning. Now, I'm not suggesting you shun anybody. But there are times in life when you need to tell someone, I need some space from you. I need you to be separate from me. And this is especially true if you're talking about problems of addiction or abusive behavior. There is nothing wrong in demanding your space and giving consequences when somebody has um, crossed a serious boundary with you. It is not only the safe and healthy thing to do, it's the godly thing to do. If you don't give consequences... It won't change. There's also emotional distance. And this is if somebody has been, has hurt you deeply or maybe possibly broken their marriage vows and have been unfaithful. And we got to understand that our actions matter. In James 2.24, it says, see, so see, <clears throat> so you see that a person is shown to be righteous through faithful actions and not just through faith alone. This is basically saying you can apologize all you want, but until that person trusts you again, they may need emotional space, and they're not wrong for taking that emotional space. You have to prove with time that you have changed. You have to prove with time that you're different. Your actions have to align with your words. And it, forgiveness doesn't always happen automatically. Sometimes people need emotional space to have time to forgive. And there also has to be an honest admitting of what you feel if you're the one who's been damaged, of using your words to really express how you have been damaged, what it makes you feel, and what it has done to you. If you can't be honest about how deeply you've been hurt, there's not going to be a lot of, it probably won't make it. But healing is always possible under the right circumstances. Time. Everybody has a different interpretation of time. When Gary and I got married, you know, we didn't marry till late in life. And, oh, my gosh, I was crazy about him. And I wanted to be with him all the time. We were in seminary together, so we, were, we had a lot of time during the day, and we could study together. And I wanted to be together nonstop. And he needed space. And I was like, what do you mean you need space? And I didn't understand that because I was just so crazy about him. I wanted to be with him, and he really needed some quiet because I never stopped talking. And so we had to have a conversation about it, that he's a different personality than I am. And it's been true through our entire marriage. He needs time alone. I really don't, but he does. And we have to be really honest about that. And then we have to be willing to give each other what the other person needs. You know, we, we're talking a lot about boundaries and respecting each other's boundaries. I just want to make this little side comment here. If someone starts giving you a boundary this week, if, you're, if your spouse decides to start giving you a boundary and telling you no or whatever, don't pout, don't be passive-aggressive, don't walk away with your feelings hurt. Do you realize what your spouse is doing for you? They're loving you more. They're making an effort to, to love you sacrificially the way Christ loves the church. Can you imagine what a brave thing that is? What an amazing thing that they're doing for you. So if someone gives you a boundary, 
thank them and then follow it because it is a gift they are giving to you. Another thing you need is other people. As much as we all want to have really healthy boundaries, let's admit it, it's going to be hard, and you, some of you need your friends to keep you accountable. Your spouse is not going to keep you accountable. You're having the boundary with them. You need to talk to people you trust. I mean those friends that are wise and godly. Don't ask your friends that are crazy and, um, you know, you know the different friends you have. But you go to people who you can trust, who will give you good wisdom. And you ask them to keep you accountable, to practice your boundaries. Because it's going to be very easy to walk away and just ignore this sermon. But if you really want to follow the standard of Christ, you need to practice your boundary. And so you can use the help of others to, to do that. And the last one is consequences. Let's be honest here. What happens with kids when you don't follow up with consequences? They do it again. The same thing is true of adults. There has to be consequences. But this is what's maybe different. You have to tell them what the consequences are. You have to lay it out. This is a hard one, and I need you to stop doing this. And here's what's going to be the consequences. Now, make sure the consequences fit the crime, you know? If it's a small thing, it should be a, you, you, you need to be loving in this. But when there's times to be firm, you had better be firm. You had better stick to the consequences because that is the only way a person will change. That's just a reality, and that's the loving thing to do, to love them really greatly. So this sermon has been, series has been interesting to um, to write. It's not been easy because I thought I had a pretty good handle on boundaries and I see that I still have a lot of work to do. I feel kind of embarrassed. I, I've been married 25 years and I, I've got some work to do. I've fallen into some habits that, you know, when you've been married a long time, you just kind of gets easy. But it's not always true to my boundaries. But I've decided that I'm not going to be ashamed of having boundary issues I should feel shame if I choose to ignore them, if I choose to do nothing about them, if I continue to practice a less than loving example with no, by not practicing all my boundaries. We've been sending these home, and I promise you this is the hardest week yet. We have these questions on the back, and really they are kind of, Gut punchers, like really going deep, asking yourself, do I have a boundary issue? It's not meant to do as a couple. And someone said to me early this morning that she knows her husband left it on the bench, and she said, don't forget that. Don't do that. But if you choose to have a marriage that is up here, as Christ loved the church, I suggest you take this home with you. I suggest that you read this and think about it and pray about it. And ask God if there's somewhere that you need to make a change. And so this week I challenge you. Do something really brave. Do something really healthy. Do something really godly. You have a boundary with somebody. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>